Fantastic. So I'll get started. Um, quick introduction to Definity. And Definity is uh, um, conceived as this intelligent decentralized cloud. Uh, it comes from a project that began in 2014. Um, involves a whole load of new cryptography and network protocols that are designed to scale out networks like Ethereum. And uh, we conceived um, Definity as a sort of experimental sister network for Ethereum. That means it's completely compatible with Ethereum. Um, so, you know, you can see um, it's really derived from Ethereum. We, we want to maintain uh, compatibility and drive towards this thing we'll term the sort of EVM singularity where um, every network is running the EVM and people can just develop dApps for the EVM and run them on different kinds of platform. Uh, Crypto3 is obsessed with speed and scale out. Uh, Casper at the moment is more, more interested in extreme uh, availability. But many of the techniques that we've developed uh, in Crypto3 can make their way into Ethereum and we hope they do. Uh, the, the key difference uh, between uh, Ethereum and Affinity is Ethereum is a coders law system, it's a traditional blockchain, whereas uh, Definity is driving towards this AI is law uh, paradigm where you have a kind of algorithmic governance system that's completely omnipotent and can control any parameter at all. You know, economic parameters, the protocol, it can freeze contracts, it can run arbitrary code that has access to uh, special opcodes in the EVM uh, and, for example, might be used to reverse, you know, the DAO hack or something like that. But it makes Definity a very, very different beast. I mean, you might even question whether it's a blockchain in the conventional sense at all. But it's certainly not the code as law as we currently understand it. So um, we have limited time. So I thought what we'd do is look at a crucial Crypto 3 technique, which might be applied in Ethereum 2, uh, called Threshold Relay. And the reason Threshold Relay is interesting is that it promises to provide uh, finality speed in public blockchains with uh, similar speed that private networks provide finality. So, you know, that means that a transaction is irreversible in just a few seconds. And it's not, it's not achieving that with a kind of old school traditional BFT protocol that's probably very unsuitable for public networks, right? Because it requires point to point connections. So you have to hide servers behind Tor addresses, right? And you can only have a handful of validators. This thing works with networks of unlimited size and a broadcast network. So, um, you know, you can imagine a network of a million mining clients, right? And you're still getting finality in just a few seconds. So that's a kind of 50x speed up uh, on compared with Ethereum today. <coughs> it also removes uh, Poisson distribution. So uh, the, the amount of computation the network can handle increases by a similar amount too. So um, we're going to drive through it super quick. This is a, a technical first slide. Don't be put off by it. This is just introducing, don't look at the formulas. This is just introducing a particular kind of threshold signature that we use. Who here knows what a threshold signature is? Hans? Not many. Okay, who knows what a digital signature is? Pretty much everyone, right. So, um, you know, the difference with, uh, between a normal uh, digital signature scheme and a threshold signature scheme is that in a threshold signature scheme, you have a group of processors or signers, right? And when they want to sign something, each member of the group creates a signature share, right, on the message. And you have to combine those signature shares to create the group threshold signature, right? So in our kind of applications, you have a group of 400, say, right? And you have a threshold of 201, okay? And uh, in order to, for the group to create a threshold signature, 201 of the group of 400 have to sign. The magic, right, which I think is uh, kind of um, not, not really well known about, is that with this special kind of signature scheme, it's called the unique and det deterministic signature scheme, no matter which subset of 201 signers sign the message, the output signature is always the same. And that output signature, of course, is a random number. And this is, you know, um, one of the most powerful tools I think we have in crypto because it allows you to reach consensus on a random number without running a consensus protocol, right? So you can have 400 processes and they want to sign some input message, right? A threshold of them do it. Any 201 can create a, sig a signature share on this message. And when you combine those signature shares, you get this output signature. And that output signature 
is always exactly the same. The bytes of it are, exa are exactly the same, irrespective of which 201 signed. So consequently, you get consensus on this random number without ever running a consensus protocol. And you might imagine, of course, that if you have consensus on this random number without running a consensus protocol, that can be used as a stepping stone to creating some broader agreement, right? So that, that's the kind of science behind this. So uh, basic threshold relay, it produces this, it's like a random beacon, it produces this incorruptible, unmanipulable, unpredictable randomness. Um, so let's just go quickly through it. What is our model? We have a peer-to-peer -peer broadcast network of mining clients. <clears throat> of course, in reality, a, a three-dimensional diagram would be far more realistic because, you know, processes make random connections to each other and that's how you get the broadcast guarantees, right? That's what happens in Ethereum today, with Kudamlia and so on. Um, and it's fast, you know, you can have potentially millions of processes in this broadcast network. So these processes, when I say a process, I really mean a mining client, okay, in Definity. And each client is expected to supply some, and at least in Definity, some fixed amount of computational resource. It has an identity and it registers itself on the ledger, right? And this isn't anything new, it's kind of proof of stake thinking, right? So, you know, for example, deposit 1,000 DFN, and now you've got a mining identity, and you configure that mining identity into your mining client, right? And your mining client can participate in the network. So <clears throat> this is where it gets interesting. All of these mining clients are assigned to groups. Each mining client can be in multiple groups, okay? And they're assigned to groups by this randomness that's produced. And here we're using different colors to show different groups. Again, it's an oversimplification because mining clients can be in multiple groups and so on. So uh, once, uh, uh, <clears throat> once a mining client has been assigned to a group with other mining clients, they run what's known as a distributed key generation uh, protocol, which enables them to set up their threshold signature scheme. Right? And once they set up this BLS threshold signature scheme, thereafter they're going to be able to produce signatures as a group unique deterministic signatures, which means there's only one possible signature that can be produced on a message. And whichever subset of the group signs, you'll always get exactly the same output threshold signature. So this thing basically progresses um, you know, independently. So here we see this blue group has set itself up and it's registered its group public key on the network. And here the pink group and the green group are independently running their setup um, protocols. And this happens independently of the progression of the blockchain. So, you know, the, the random number, the random beacon says, hey, you can go off and set up a group and you can go off and set up a group, but you do that in the, the group tries to set up independently. And, you know, typically there'll be a timeout. If, if within a thousand blocks or something, they manage to do the DKG, distributed key generation protocol, they come back and they just, you know, register their group public key on the network. So here we are, we've got a whole bunch of extra groups. So as regards the blockchain itself, um, at any particular height, there is a current group, right? And so here we're at height H, and we've got this pink group. Of course, again, oversimplification. Um, we've got like 400, we use processes in a group. And forget the formula again, but <clears throat> uh, the group at the current height signs the signature of the group at the previous height. So if you're at H, you're the group at H. To relay to the next H plus one, what you do is you just create a signature of the, on the signature at H minus one, right? So <clears throat> this creates a new random number. Here we have it, sigma, that sigma symbol is just the signature, right? Signa, so the signature at H, you can just modulo it by the length of the list of groups, and of course, that will give you the next group. It randomly selects the next group, right? That's the relay. Very, very simple. So what we're gonna do is just relay between these groups. Right, and here we're going, relaying between that yellow group, the pink group, the green group, and the blue group, right? That's what, that's what, that, that's what threshold relay is. It's not a complex thing at all. And that's very important, because if you look at the successful protocols like proof of work, although it's obviously, in my view, obsolete now, but um, you know, they, they were fundamentally quite simple, so people could grasp them with a bit of effort, right? And this is the same. You know, each group is just signing the signature of the previous group and producing a new random number, but it's unmanipulable, right? There's only one possible signature. This is completely deterministic. And the next uh, random value is um, released upon the agreement of a threshold right, of, of the current group. They just broadcast their signature shares 
and anybody can combine these signature shares to create the next random value. And there's only one random value possible, right? And it doesn't matter from which subset of the group you, you collect these signature shares. You always get the same, same one. So this is it, right? So here we go. Here's a group at h minus one. This is the block height h, right? H, uh, and, and it produces a signature, sigma h minus one, right? Modulo that by the length of the, uh, the uh, you know, the set of groups, and you, you select group at h, right? Okay, simple enough. Um, each of the members of uh, the group at h broadcasts a signature share, right? P is a member of the group at h, that's all it's saying, and this sigma here is a, is a signature share, and you can aggregate them using BLS, and you get a new threshold signature, right? And then, then just do the same thing, you just right, modulo it by the length of the list of groups, and you've selected the next group, and you relay it again. And that's threshold relay. So, uh, what do we get from this? Well, we get a decentralized VRF. What is a VRF? It's a, it's a word you need to know about. It's, it's verifiable random function. Verifiable random function. And it's a random function that can be verified by anybody on the network. Because we all know what the public keys of the groups are. They're registered on the ledger. And of course, there's only one possible signature on a message, and it validates against the public key. Um, and so we get this sequence of random numbers being produced that's completely uh, verifiable, right? Um, it has some special properties. It's deterministic, right? It's completely deterministic. It's verifiable, and it's unmanipulable. And uh, the other really important aspect of this, and we'll get back to why this is important, is it's unpredictable. You can never foresee the sequence of randomness in advance. The next random value is only released upon agreement of a threshold of the current group, okay? It's impossible to know in any other way without that group releasing the next random value, it's impossible to see what the next value is. It's unpredictable. And this is an absolutely essential property. And if you look at a lot of the proof of stake and candidate kind of protocols out there, they're very flawed um, uh, in, in this crucial respect, you know, that you can often either manipulate the random values that are produced or you can predict them in some ways. And it turns out that you, you need this, the, these properties. So Donald Nuff, uh, old school computer science guy, um, said this, you know, right, random numbers should not be generated with a method cho chosen at random. And this is very true, and it holds true in, in decentralization too. You need to have these kind of uh, strong systems. So, you know, quickly, uh, unmanipulable randomness is extremely useful. So on the left here, we have scale out decentralized network protocols, Definity protocols, this thing called Crypto3. We're going to look at next probabilistic blockchain uh, probabilistic slot protocols, it's called. Um, this depends on it. But there's a bunch of other things called like validation towers, validation trees, usids, and all these things. I don't know if you've heard me speak about them uh, over the last couple of years, but they all depend upon randomness. Also, things like uh, lottery charging and lazy validation. So, for example, Definity began, you know, one of the key requirements of the project was that we should eventually be able to host not only things like Uber, like decentralized versions of Uber, but, but search engines, like right? yeah, decentralized web search, right? And that presents really uh, big challenges with respect to performance, because users want to see the search results come back straight away and so on, right? And um, it turns out the, you can solve these problems if you have this, sort, this kind of source of randomness. You can do things like lottery charging and lazy validation. But this kind of stuff only works if you have this incorruptible, unmanipulable unpredictable randomness. Um, at the on the application there, you also need randomness for advanced applications. There's a project called Phi, which is a kind of sort of decentralized uh, commercial banking system that produces a thing called crypto fiat. And it, it does this by giving out loans algorithmically, right? It's an autonomous system that gives out loans using validators as proxies. It's only able to do this if it has this kind of random source of, uh, source of random numbers. So, okay, so quickly, just before we move on, you may be asking, what's the fault tolerance here? Okay, so just to give you an idea, um, imagine you've got 10,000 mining clients, call them processors and distributed computing speak, and of, of those, 3,000 are faulty, right? <clears throat> Somehow, which is a pretty catastrophic situation. Um, the group size is 400, threshold's 201. If you, if you randomly take 400 processes from the 10,000, of which 3,000 are faulty, what is the chance that 200 or more of those processes that you re randomly selected will be faulty, right? And therefore, the network will, will stall or not be able to produce the random number. Turns out 10 to the minus 17, right? That's just using hypergeometric probability. 10 to the minus 17. And if you weren't happy with 10 to the minus 17, which is, I don't know what it is, something, you know, trillion years or something, 
um, you could just increase the group size. Uh, communications overhead, I won't go through this, but you know, in order for this group of 400 to produce the next random number using threshold relay, it works out you need to transfer in practice about 22 kilobytes of data. Just imagine, 22 kilobytes of data is all you need to broadcast in order to create the next random number. Nothing, right? This thing flies. And the actual uh, encryption behind this is extremely efficient too. So, so uh, threshold relay blockchain, uh, simple probabilistic slot protocol. We're going to go super quick, but try and bear with it. So at each height, right, the randomness creates an ordered list of processes. So at H minus 3, you can see the randomness has ordered the processes. Every process in the system, we're starting with process 4243, that's just as ID, then the next one is 3911. At every different block height, we just create a random ordering of the processes from the random number. You can imagine that these are assigned to slots. And you know, obviously the process at the top of the, the, the front of the list is in slot zero and so on. And then once you've assigned processes to slots, you can then score any kind of blocks they might produce, right? So you'd say, okay, <clears throat> if you're a process, if you're a mining client in uh, slot zero, you know, your block is going to be worth one point. If you're in slot one, it's going to be worth half a point and so on. You can also do things like say, well, if you're in slot zero, you can, if the block time's five seconds, you can immediately have your block relayed after five seconds. If you're in slot one, in six seconds and so on. So trivially then, we can create some kind of blockchain, right? And here, here we're showing uh, how you might score this, right? So you've, you've got a chain that's rooted at h minus 3, and sorry, two, two forks that are rooted in h minus 3, the orange and the green chain. And at h, we can do a relative score from that common root, and, and a correct process would always choose the highest scoring chain head, right? So we can see here the orange chain has 300, three and a half points from the common root, and the green chain has uh, three points from the common root, so a correct process would build on the orange chain. Um, and that's all very nice. So we've created some kind of blockchain that converges. But of course, what we haven't dealt with is the classic problems of selfish mining attacks and nothing at stake, which bedevil proof of, proof of stake uh, protocols, because it's much uh, cheaper to do. Right? With Bitcoin, you have to mine each block. right? Um, and this basically greatly reduces the consistency of the chain and, the, and, and increases the time to finality. So the solution is uh, to have the threshold groups additionally notarize blocks. right? And this means that a valid block at H, right, it, it can only build upon a block that's been notarized at H minus one, right? So the, in addition to these, the threshold groups, in addition to creating the randomness, right, relaying between the groups, before they do that, they're also going to notarize at least one block, right? And you can only build on a notarized block. And this has this amazing um, property that now the blocks must be published in good time or they'll have no chance of notarization. You can't withhold blocks anymore, right? If an adversary has a block and they withhold it, well, guess what? The, the, the groups are going to move on, and you've missed your chance of notarization. So we basically solve, solve these problems. So um, we're running out of time. So quickly, you know, when, when, when a group is selected, the members of the group start their stopwatches, and they wait for the expiry of the block time. They're queuing up chain heads in a priority order while they're waiting. Uh, we'll kind of skip this, but very basically, they um, once the block time expires, all they're doing is they look at the, 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 the first input block. If they've not seen a high scoring block, they, they broadcast a threshold signature share on it, right? And they keep on doing that when, when they, whenever they see a, a high, high scoring block. And, and as soon as they see that their group has created at least one threshold signature on, on, the, uh, on a block at the current height, they just relay to the next group, right? And what you get is this um, incredibly fast convergence now because, you know, forks collapse, right? Unless something gets notarized, it dies, it's pruned, okay? Um, so you now have a much, much faster converging chain, right? Selfish mining isn't really possible because if you withhold a block, nobody can see it. The group's not going to, the current group's not going to notarize it. And once you've gone to the next group, right, it's too late, right? It kind of traps shut and... Uh, that's dead, right? So what's really interesting, so we've already got a blockchain that's you know, vastly faster than anything that's uh, around at the moment. But the, the really interesting thing is um, that arguably you can get finality in two, two confirmations and one relay. And the reason is that if there's an alternative, if no alternative chain head has appeared here, for example, at H, right? We're at H plus one. Um, and 
an H plus one has no tries to current block and relate, well, you know, if there was an alternative chain head at H, it should have appeared. And since it hasn't appeared and we've relayed from H plus one, well, even if it exists, it doesn't matter because it can't get notarized now, right? The group at H is no longer signing, it's relayed, right? So um, if you, in this case, if you have a, a block time of uh, five seconds, um, you're looking at sort of average finality time of seven and a half seconds. But you know, in practice, I think we'll be able to get you know, the, the block time down to, I don't know, you know say like two seconds. So you're looking at you know, say two to three seconds finality is kind of possible in, in optimal, normal operation with, with this kind of system. So you know, that, that would, of course, be like 100 times faster than Ethereum today. I don't know if you've ever tried to build something like a financial exchange on Ethereum, but it's very, very difficult because currently, because you know, you're, you're showing you know, a market state to the participants, but that, the state of that market can change, right? And how do you display that in the user interface? It's extraordinarily difficult, right? How do you, show, how do you convey to a user that a reorganization has occurred? It's, it's, it's almost impossible, especially with complex applications. But with this, these new kind of uh, crypto protocols, we can... Um, Produce finality in just you know a few seconds, and so you you can just delay delay showing updates to users until finality has occurred, right? And this is a big game changer, and it means that we can start to look at the virtual computer that you know protocols like Ethereum create um, as m much more similarly to how we would have you know viewed the server computers of the past, right? It's not the case that just because it's a blockchain system that it has to have terrible performance. We can actually start building applications on the virtual computer that's produced by protocol execution, right? And you know, these applications that are built on top of it are gonna be able to have reasonable performance, right? I think that's, that's the future, and I, I'm at, kind of out of time, but um, yeah, and the, the takeaway from this is you know, selfish mining, nothing, nothing at stake, and equivocation is addressed by this protocol. Obviously, other things like scalability and so on, you, know, you can use any number of nodes. Um, it works with SPV, I won't go into that. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can see the progress. It's incredible, right? I mean, you go from like one hour with Bitcoin, really six confirmations, 37 confirmations, like 10 minutes with, with Ethereum today, uh, down to like seven and a half seconds, but that's being very conservative. That's like a five second block time. You, 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 can, you can go below that. Um, you also get this huge increase. We get rid of the Poisson distribution, huge increase in computational capacity of the virtual computer. Um, yeah, we know about all this and problems with proof of work. Um, so, you know, I mean, without getting into, uh, you know, thinking about how we should design next generation networks, but clearly, you know, proof of work is, you know, is created back in 2008. Um, the designer of it is no longer around. And, um, you know, it models up a lot of things, civil resistance, you know, validation, state storage, and consensus. And, you know, the, the networks of the future will break these things up, much in the same way, you know, TCP IP breaks things up. Um, and this is the kind of architecture you'll see to, you know, when you talk about the infinite, infinite, infinite virtual computers, right? Infinitely scalable, virtual computers, and that's what we want, right? We want a virtual computer that's highly performant and has um, infinite processing capacity, right? It can scale out with new miners, and the way you do that is having a top-level consensus uh, layer, which is something like a threshold relay chain that produces this random beacon, and that random beacon can drive a, validation, a global validation there, right? Which, in this case, in, in, our, in our case, uh, comprises of this thing called a validation tree, where the nodes are validation towers. It's roughly analogous to a Merkle tree, and then down the bottom, you have kind of state storage. Uh, and that's it. Finally, um, yeah, there's some code, like Timo, uh, in, in the audience here. If, if someone's interested in actually looking at some of the uh, threshold, threshold relay uh, crypto proofs of concept and the actual uh, cryptography code, uh, it's online. I think that's not actually, there is actually another, I need to update this, right? There's actually a, there's a GitHub repo. Anyway, that's it. Thanks.